Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Genesis, right at the front of your Bible, right after the table of contents, in fact. Genesis, chapter number 3. You recall that God made the heavens and the earth. Now, understand, there are those who dispute that fact, but I just have a tendency to believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that it is absolutely true. And so I don't have any problem at all saying that I believe God created the heavens and the earth. I also believe He created them in in six literal days, rest of the seventh day. I don't think that it was a day was a million years for this to happen. I don't believe that He used evolution. I think just as Genesis says, God created the heavens and the earth. I needed to clear that up in case you were wondering about that before I got started, okay? Okay. Uh, The crown of God's creation was God created man and woman. He created Adam and Eve. He placed them in a perfect environment. They were in the Garden of Eden. They fellowshiped daily with God. They had all of creation at their disposal. God put one restriction. Somebody said, well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, the the test of a person's love toward God is obedience. And if there was no opportunity to disobey God, there would be no test of their obedience. And so God said, you can eat of all the trees in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, by this time, Satan had fallen. He was created as an angel, but because of his rebellion against God, He and one-third of the angels were cast out of heaven, and uh, Satan began his work to defeat everything that God is for. That'd be a discouraging job, wouldn't it, to try to fight forever against God? And so one day Eve is in the garden, and Satan, in the form of a serpent, says to her, it's just a shame that God has been so unkind to you. And she says, he's been good. And he said, well, yeah, but he won't let you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because God knows that if you eat of that tree, you'll be like God. And I won't go into the whole story, but she was tempted, she was beguiled, she was deceived, and she took of that forbidden fruit. And then she gave it to her husband. Now, the Bible tells us that Eve was tricked. Eve was deceived. But Adam sinned on purpose. Adam knew what he was doing. He knew the consequences. And you say, wow, how foolish is that? Why would he do something like that? Well, probably the same reason you and I, who know something's wrong, do it anyway. Yeah. Well... Adam partook of the forbidden fruit, and immediately, the Bible says, their eyes were opened. Immediately, they knew they had done wrong. And so they ran to hide from God. They hid themselves. And once again, knowing God, where are you going to go to hide? You're going to find a cave, and God doesn't know you're there? Get behind a big tree, and He can't see you? Listen... God knows everything. God knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. And so they're hiding from God. And the Bible says that God said, Adam, where art thou? Now this wasn't because God was curious. God knew where they were. This question was given to Adam. So that Adam could think a little bit, where am I really? Let's read the scripture. If you're able to stand, I invite you to stand with me. And we'll begin in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know 
that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for this story. I thank you that we don't have to wonder how everything got started, but you tell us in the book of beginnings exactly how it happened. Lord, in this passage, we learn how sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so, Lord, I pray as I look at this scripture that it might be a help to us as we also answer that question, where are we? God bless the preaching and please bless the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. The woman was deceived. The man was on purpose disobedient. And now both of them together come up with, uh, what are we going to do? They, they uh, covered themselves as best they knew how. They hid themselves hoping that maybe God just wouldn't be concerned. Maybe God just wouldn't be bothered. Maybe God would just let things go. Maybe it wasn't as big a deal as it really seemed to be. You know, that's a great mistake that people often make. Maybe God doesn't mean what he said in the Bible. Maybe God doesn't expect us to have our sins forgiven. Maybe God doesn't mind if we indulge in a little bit of sin. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Let me remind you, this is the Word of God. It's absolute truth. And if God said it, God means it. And so they're in the garden, they're hiding themselves, and God says the question, where are you? Let me ask that question this morning to each individual in this room. Spiritually, where are you? You know, on a scale of one to ten, where are you in your spiritual life? Are you, are you living for God? Are you doing what's right? Do you have the kind of relationship that you need? I, this, this is just me asking the question, but understand, as I'm asking the question, each day God is examining you. Where are you? Where are you in your walk with God? Where are you in your Christian living? Hey, how about this one? In your family. Where are you? Husbands, dads, are you the spiritual leader in your home? Are you the example that you want your children to follow? Are you the man that your wife deserves to be a spiritual leader? Where are you? Well, you know, I could probably do better. Well, you know, there was a time that I was on fire. Well, you know, I'm just growing slowly, uh, honestly ask the questions in your family life, where, where are you? Ladies, wives, moms, grandparents, young people, where are you? As God looks at our life, as God measures us, not on some scale as we compare ourselves to folks that live down the block or people that we know who used to go to church or even some that sit in our pew and we feel pretty good about ourselves compared to them. Uh, Understand the Bible is pretty clear that when we measure ourselves by ourselves and compare ourselves among ourselves, we're not wise. Because my standard is not Pastor Ross and his standard is not Larry Goldsworthy. Our standard is God. And so is yours. And so just as God asked these who had indulged in sin, just as God had asked these who hoped that they could get away with it, just as God had asked these who now were feeling guilty about what they had done but didn't know how to take care of it, God asks you and me this morning, 
Where are you? Well, according to the Bible, there are several different places that we could be, several places that we might be. Some find themselves unsaved, abiding under the wrath of God. Here's what the scripture says about the unsaved person in John 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You know, oftentimes we think of the judgment to come for the unsaved. Someday they'll be in hell. Someday they'll be miserable. Someday they'll be suffering. Someday they'll be tormented. But the Bible is very clear that a man, a woman, a child without Christ is presently abiding under the wrath of God. In his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, Jonathan Edwards used the illustration of a person hanging by a spider's web over hell. At any moment it could unravel. At any moment they could be plunged. Understand that if you're not saved, and by being saved I don't mean that you're a member of Rochester Hills Baptist Church. I don't mean that you go to any church. I'm not talking about the fact that you live a good life or you're a good parent or a, or a moral person or even an encouragement to your parents. By being saved, I mean have your sins been forgiven? Do you know for sure? You see, scripturally, the Bible teaches we're all sinners. Nobody would dispute that. We're all guilty before God. And because of our sin, we deserve to go to hell. But God has made provision for us. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins. He offered Himself as our substitute. He provided Himself as our sacrifice. He paid what we owe. He suffered and bled and died and rose again, proving that our salvation had been complete. All we have to do is receive it. But until you receive that salvation, you are not saved. Until you accept the gift of God, which is eternal life, you are not saved. You say, well, I, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Well, then chances are you aren't. Here's, here's why I say that. I've never heard anybody say, you know what, I wonder if I'm married. I just, I, I, I can't remember. You know, my mom told me I was, but my mother-in-law says I'm not. Yeah, no, no, I... Uh, now, now it, you may not remember the date, especially if you're a guy. You may not remember how many years ago it was. You may not remember the colors. Who cares about that stuff? What you know is you got married. I was there. I even remember part of the sermon. He said, you may kiss the bride. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know, by the way, I know that I'm saved. I don't know the date. I don't know what I was wearing. I don't even remember the sermon that the preacher preached when I got saved. I remember the one he preached the night before because that's what God used to convict my heart. But I know that I got saved. I can remember him showing me the scriptures. And I bowed my head and I accepted Christ. And that moment I got saved. If you're saved, you know it. If you're not saved, according to the Bible, right now you are abiding under the wrath of God. Picture a, a load of giant rocks ready to fall and crash on you. And all that keeps you from misery and torment forever is the mercy and the grace of God. As God gives you at least one more chance to get saved. So let me ask you this. Where are you? If you are not saved, you ought to move out of condemnation and move into assurance. You ought to move out of that place where you're on your way to hell and make sure that you're on your way to heaven. If you're not saved, you ought to get that taken care of today. If you're not sure that you're saved. 
And as I mentioned, salvation is not in a church. It's not in a series of good works. It's simply in what Christ did for us on the cross. If you're not sure that you're saved, you need to get saved even this morning. But there are many who are saved, and some are like Jonah. They're sound asleep running from God. Remember the story? Remember how God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach? And Jonah said, no way. I'm not going to preach to those guys. And he got on board ship to sail in the opposite direction, running away from God. He went down below ship and he fell fast asleep. And while he's asleep, God sent a storm. The whole purpose of the storm was to get Jonah's attention. By the way, if you're running from God, he's going to get your attention sooner or later. Now understand, when God first began to try to get Jonah's attention, Jonah was oblivious, but everyone around him knew it was problems. That ship was tossed to and fro in the waves. They're frightened that the ship will be crushed. Maybe they'll be capsized or drowned. And so even these ungodly, irreligious sailors began to pray, to beg whatever God it was that they were uh, familiar with, to spare them, to save them. They knew that there was a problem. But Jonah sound asleep. Jonah sound asleep. No idea that there's a problem. And so his rebellion caused great problems to those on board ship. Caused them discomfort physically caused them to be emotionally disturbed, caused them to lose possessions? How many people find themselves in a mess because of the sins of others? How many homes have been devastated because of the sins of others? How many lives have been ruined because of the sins of others? And the one who's responsible, he's fast asleep. Hey, not just the guys on the boat, but there's an entire city of 600,000 children. They're going to die without Christ, and they're going to die without hope. And Jonah is sound asleep. What do you mean, asleep? How are we asleep? And I'm not talking about those of you resting right now. Years ago, I heard Curtis Hudson say, I don't mind when people sleep while I'm preaching. They trust me. It's the ones that take notes that make me nervous. Because they have evidence. Occasionally, somebody will say to me, they say, Brother Hal, I'm sorry, I tried my best, but I was up all night. I, I couldn't help it, I fell asleep. And, I, and I, I'm almost embarrassed to say, I, I didn't notice. I never notice if people are sleeping, so, so go ahead and take a nap if you need it. I, I won't even notice. If you snore, I'll notice. No, I'm not talking about physically asleep. I'm talking about asleep to the things of God where you come to church week after week after week after week and never one time does God challenge your heart. Never one time do you see the need to respond at the altar. There are Christians who have been in church for years and never one time has God impressed upon them they ought to do business with Him at the altar. You are either a very, very good Christian or maybe you're dozing a bit. What about those who have been saved, but they never have really gotten to the place where they want to live for God? Never have got to the place where they're ready to do right. (coughs) Talking about those who have been saved, but they don't read their Bible on a regular basis. Talking about those who have been saved, they don't pray every day. Talking about those who have been saved, and God has blessed you with more blessings than you could ever count in a year, and still you won't even give him 10% of your income. Talking about that kind of a sleep. Talking about those who are asleep, who work with people all around you that are unsaved, and never one time have you spoken to them about their soul. Talking about those who uh, are members of a church for years and years and years, 
a church that has junior church and bus ministry and Sunday school and Reformers Unanimous and Awana and a multitude of other ministries, a Christian school, and never once have you even volunteered to help do anything. Asleep. Running from God. Don't misunderstand. I'm very, very thankful that you're here. I'm glad that you're in church. But recognize this fact. God saved you for more than occupying a spot in the auditorium. God saved you that you might serve Him. And the whole purpose of church is to come and, and get your tools sharpened so that you might go out and do the job that God has prepared just for you. And so some are abiding under the wrath of God and others are asleep. Not even aware of what they ought to be doing, they should be doing, and what God would want them to do. Some, like Elijah, they're alone and discouraged. Amazing story. Elijah's up on Mount Carmel. 450 false prophets. They have a contest. These guys try to pray fire down from heaven. Nothing happens. Elijah begs God. Fire falls, consumes the offering. And the whole crowd, they were trying to decide, is Baal God or is the Lord God? The whole crowd now cries out, the Lord, He is God. And Jezebel the queen gets upset. Because she was a Baal worshiper, and those were her prophets, and that was her church. And so she says to Elijah, she said, I'm going to kill you. And the guy who stood up to 450 false prophets now runs from a woman. And he sits under a juniper tree, and he just sits there wishing he could die. And God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? He said, I'm the only one. Nobody else even cares about you. I might as well just up and die. And the Lord doesn't say it like this, but if you read it, it's pretty close. He says, Elijah, quit being a baby. God reminds him of how he's blessed him. You know, sometimes we get discouraged, don't we? Sometimes it just seems like life is not fair. We did the best that we could raising our children. We kept them in church. We taught them right. And now they're not living for God. It doesn't seem fair. There, we, we, our, our families in church, we're trying to do what God would have us to do. We love the Lord. We try to serve Him. There are other folks, they don't care a thing about God. And we have sickness in our family. It doesn't seem fair. There are folks who are so ungodly, they wouldn't even bow their head to thank the Lord for for their meal, and yet God has provided for them financially, and they're doing so wonderfully, and yet we're struggling. We're barely making it. It just doesn't seem fair. And we wonder, God, why, why this for us? Why this for me? It is not fair. And just like God said to Elijah, he said, what are you doing here? Haven't I blessed you? God says, look at your family. Look at your, count your blessings. Think about all that I've done for you. Worst case, you say, well, we're out of money. We don't have any money. Okay, let's suppose that you're so broke that you can't buy food and you starve to death. I heard heaven's not that bad. You're not feeling well. Do you realize that eventually all of us will not feel well? God didn't make us to live in these bodies forever. And I've noticed as my wife is getting older, time goes by so much quicker. I say that, she's, she's older than I am. That's true. You, I would have to tell you, you wouldn't notice it. It was, it was, we got married during the Vietnam War, and all the guys her age were off fighting the battle, so she, she got a younger guy. Boy, am I in trouble. <laughs> you can call me this afternoon and say, where are you? <laughs> 
In the doghouse. I, I forgot the point I was making. <laughs> oh, oh, eventually, I, I don't know many people that are 120 years old. Eventually, we are all going to reach the expiration dates on these bodies. But recognize, God didn't make us to live here forever. He made us for heaven. He made us to spend forever with Him. And so, all of our discouragements, and all of our trials, and all of our troubles, and all of our difficulties, these are simply tools that we might better serve Him while we're here. How many of you can look back on a really rough time in your life. Maybe family, maybe physical, maybe finances. But you can look back. You're over it now. You're not going through it. But you're over it now. And you look back and say, you know what? At the time, it was traumatic. But God taught me more. I became a better Christian. The Lord showed me more than probably any other time in my life. It was through the difficulties, through the hardships. Let me see the hands. Yeah. Yeah. And yet Elijah is going through a tough time and he's feeling sorry for himself. Understand this no matter how lonely you feel, God knows where you are. No matter how it seems like nobody understands, God understands. No matter how difficult it is, nothing is impossible with God. And so. Even though you feel like you're all alone, He's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. Even though you feel like you're not able to carry on and you just can't even make another step, God has promised that His grace is sufficient for you. And His strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. God said to Adam, he said, where are you? And Adam said, well, we're uh, kind of embarrassed, you know. We ate that fruit and figured out we're naked. Or we, we had to get dressed before you came by today. God's the one that made them. God's the one that knew exactly what they had done. And God said, you know, it's not really... Your clothing that has you concerned, Adam, it's your heart. He said, what have you done? And Adam said, well, you know, we, we ate the fruit, but God, it wasn't my fault. It's that woman you gave me. And she goes, oh, it wasn't my fault. It was the serpent. And they just kind of passed the blame on down the line. And you know what God told them? Everybody is responsible for his or her own actions. He said to Adam, he said, you you knew right, you did wrong. Because of that, for the rest of your life and all of your children and their children and their children and their children are going to have to travail to get their food. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to work. He said to Eve, he said, because of your wrong, he said, childbirth, although it'll be a blessing, it'll be a physical struggle. There'll be much pain and much grief in childbirth. And he said to the serpent, he said, this is mainly all your fault. So one of these days, the seed of the woman, you'll crush his heel, but he'll crush your head. And that's exactly what happened on Calvary. The Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, crushed the head of the serpent. And so I guess the whole focus of the message this morning is to recognize God knows where you are. But not only does He know where you are, He knows where you should be. He knows where you ought to be. He knows the tools that He's given to you. He knows the blessings that you've enjoyed. He knows all that you have. He knows all that you could do and should do. And so the question isn't, where are you? It's, why aren't you where you should be? And so let me ask you again this morning, the first question I asked when we started the message. Spiritually, where are you? 
Are you living for God? I mean, if, if you stood before him right now, oh, would you be embarrassed like Adam and Eve were because they knew they'd done wrong and they hadn't taken care of it? If you're not saved, are you ready to stand before God? If you are saved, are you living such a life that you have no regrets? I'm not saying that you've done everything perfect. None of us have, of course. But, but have you confessed your sins? Are you right with God? Are you surrendered? Are you willing to do whatever God would have you to do? Simply put, church, where are we spiritually?